Hey guys, and welcome back to a new video. We are just gonna do a really good old fashioned, simple Q&A today. I have, I think, six questions here that have come in um, over the last few weeks from some recent videos, a smattering of different topics, and I don't have any notes here. I'm gonna look over and read the questions and then I'm just gonna do the answers off the cuff. So you may have to deal with me talking uh, around, talking through my ideas uh, a bit more than I even usually do, even when I do have notes. So hopefully you are on board for that, uh, for a little chatty Q and A here. So I'm just gonna dive right in with the first question. This is from Fashion Art Ventures, and they write, how do you deal with clients who ask you to change your artistic style for a commission? So um, I think that this is probably more of a challenge for beginning illustrators and uh, people who are just getting started and you know maybe some of the clients that you're working for are like family and friends or friends of friends and they've gotten recommended to you because you know you have somebody who you're close with and they say oh you want something drawn you should go see my friend so and so so they're at that stage they're not necessarily coming to you for your style in particular they're coming to you because you're the only person that they know who can draw and uh, yeah if that's the case I think that that may be something that comes up quite a bit um, for me, it, it hasn't actually been a huge thing. It's happened a few times. Uh, so personally, I can't say it's like a really, yeah, it's not like a, a really big challenge for me. Uh, from the beginning, people tended to come to me for my particular style. Um, that being said, there have been a couple of times. Um, one, I think I have talked about before, this was less of a, a question, well, it was somewhat a question of style, but uh, it was also a question of like substance and subject matter. And I was um, requested to do something that I, to, to change my style quite a bit, and then to do something that I just felt like ethically, um, unsettled about like it wasn't outright oh that's wrong but it just didn't feel great to me so in that sense I turned down that commission this was a couple of years ago and then the only other time I can specifically think um that I had that I was asked to have my style changed was uh an existing client somebody who I had worked with before and uh, it was for packaging and they, they had done their first round with the packaging was um, very standard, my very standard style. And uh, then they were developing a new line that was gonna be a little bit different. And so they wanted the illustration to have a different look. And they were actually really great. They said like, hey, you know, we're not sure if you're up for doing this. Like if you, if you don't want to, you know, we can go in another direction. And I actually put myself out there and I was like, no, I will, I'll try this. I'll, I'll do this in a slightly different style. And it was really challenging, um, but, uh, but I enjoyed it. And what felt okay about that situation is it they didn't come to me like with another illustrator's work saying like hey we want you to do something in this style or we want you to copy this style um that would probably feel icky to me because i well i can it would definitely feel icky to me <laughs> i wouldn't want to do that because i would say why don't you if you want something that style you should just go talk to that illustrator um but yeah i know that that's something that happens a lot to kind of new coming up illustrators uh, and if, if that did happen to me, if I was asked to copy someone else's style, um, I think I, I would say no. <laughs> um, but yeah, in a situation where I had the existing relationship with the client and it was kind of a shift in gears with style, but it was still the media that I liked to use, the subject I was very familiar with. And then in that instance, it felt like um, more of a fun challenge. So I think it's, it's completely up to you. It's personal. Um, if it's happening to you a lot, uh, and you're in that beginning phase, just keep making plenty of personal work so you can get your style really well, well established. And, uh, yeah, putting that personal work out there on your portfolio, on your social media. And, uh, if you do get asked to do something that is a style that you really don't like, don't put that in your portfolio <laughs> because then people will come back to you for that style. So continue to make lots of work in the style that you want to do and only put that work in your portfolio. So if I don't want to get commissioned again for another, uh, for a project that was similar to one that I just finished, I just don't share that. I don't put it online. I don't put it in my portfolio. Um, if I don't want to get more work like that, I just keep it to myself. So that would be the other thing I would say about it. Um, I hope that's helpful. 
Uh, next question is from Tally. Um, Tally uh, had watched the the one the first thing that you should do as a beginning illustrator, and uh, in that video we talked about kind of the three stages. Whether you're in a, a, a stage where you're just getting started and you're kind of digging and figuring out what you want to do creatively, um, or whether you're in a stage where you're like really kind of polishing that and getting better at it and putting a a, a more and more refined product out there, or whether you're in a phase where you are um, really kind of actively trying to get the word out, trying to share your work, trying to do promo, all of that. And Tally commented, a uh, really helpful video. Uh, I know what subjects I want to draw and paint, so where would I fall uh, in these three categories? Would they be in that initial phase, which we were using the, the framework from Creative Pep Talk from uh, Andy, Andy J. Miller, Andy J. Pizza's uh, framework, the mining, refining, and shining. So uh, Tally wants to know, would they be in that mining phase, that initial phase that um shining oh no sorry refining phase the phase where you're polishing or the the third phase the phase where you're sharing the shining phase so um without a little bit more info i can't really say so if you say uh, i know what subjects i want to draw and paint um what phase would i be in you might be in the refining phase in the middle phase but you might also still just be in in the in the mining phase in that very early phase because really to me the biggest difference is your motivation and and how much work you're able to get done. So if you uh, have an idea, if you say like, oh, I really like drawing, you know, beautiful girls with flower in their, flowers in their hair. Um, you may think that that's what you like doing, but until you are actually able to spend hours and hours consistently day in, day out doing that, um, then I think you're probably still in the mining phase. So if you're in the phase where you just have an idea and you think this is what I like doing, but you haven't actually done it a lot yet, you probably still haven't moved on into the, the middle phase, the refining phase. So once you have an idea uh, of what you like drawing, uh, whether it's it's media, subject, whatever, you have an approach that, that works for you and you're able to do that consistently and it doesn't feel like pulling teeth, you, you actually look forward to doing it, uh, then I think it's that's when you move on to that middle phase, the refining phase, and you start creating a more and more polished body of work that is ready to, uh, that's ready to shine, that's ready to be shared with the world, shared with art directors, all of that. So, um, yeah, I would just ask yourself, okay, you know, do I have this concept? Is it something I'm actually doing or do I just have it like at an intellectual level? Because, uh, before I had made that shift, before I had moved from the mining phase to the refining phase, I had a lot of ideas about what I thought I liked drawing, um, but I wasn't actually doing it. <laughs> so if it's, if it's not something that's happening in your day-to-day -day life, then you know, you can question yourself and see like, really, am I, do I still need to go back to the drawing board? Like if this is something that I think I like doing, but I don't actually like doing it. If I like the idea more than the reality, then you probably need to go back to the drawing board um, back to the back to digging. You need to dig deeper. Keep uh, trying to figure out the thing that really will spark that for you. That really will spark that inspiration and the motivation to keep making work day in and day out. Um, if you haven't seen that video yet, I will also link that in the description. Next question is from Cat O'Lion, who asks: uh, An illustrator told me to use wax-based pencils along with my Prismacolor to help with blending. I haven't tried that, um, but do you know how it works? Uh, so I do have, I think that they're probably talking about the colorless blenders, which are just basically the material that's from the Prismacolor core, the binder material without any pigment in it. Uh, I'm just not a huge fan. I've tried them. I've tried a few different brands. I've tried, um, I think I've tried like three or four different brands of colorless, uh, blenders and I, yeah, I just don't really like them that much. And even, even if you're doing burnishing, which is when you really press the pencil hard, uh, super hard into the paper to try to kind of get the pigment down into all the little, um, the nooks and crannies, the, the tooth of the paper. Uh, I would just prefer to use the actual color as opposed to the blender. Uh, so yeah, it's not, it's not my preference. Some people do really like it and it, it does work, but I don't really think that you need one. I think if you want to use it for burnishing, which is the type of blending you would use it for, I think it's just as easy to use the colors themselves. Uh, and if you don't want to burnish, I would infinitely prefer blending with some sort of a solvent. Like I use Gamsol, Odorless Mineral Spirit. 
um, with the windows open, folks. Uh, yes, um, that is what I have to say about that. Uh, moving on uh, to the next one from Michelle Young. Um, Michelle had left kind of a long comment and then had this question at the end. Uh, if something should happen to artists' YouTube channels due to the new regulations, would you post your YouTube content on a different platform and or uh, Patreon? So I think what this is about is about the new regulations related to like having programming for kids. Uh, I don't know um, if, if, this, if that's not what this is about, um, then steer me in a different direction in the comments, Michelle. But um, let's just take it as a very broad, open-ended hypothetical if for some reason something were to happen to content on YouTube. Um, I, uh, I don't have, I don't have my videos backed up anywhere else besides on YouTube. I'm just going to be real with you guys. Like I've made a lot of videos now over the years. I don't have them share. I don't have them saved, um, on my desktop or, um, or Dropbox or anywhere because they would take up a lot of space. Maybe that is something I should do. But honestly, at this point, I felt like if something, if YouTube were to go down and all that content would be lost, I would be bummed, but I also, I would just, I'd start putting stuff out there somewhere else. Um, so if this is something you're worried about, um, I would encourage you to just subscribe to my newsletter because that is a way that, you know, if for some reason catastrophe were to strike YouTube and I would be completely gone from YouTube, um, you can, if you are subscribed to my newsletter, you can be sure that I will update folks there on wherever the new, the new place that I am posting content if that ever happens. That being said, I am not planning on anything happening to YouTube. I'm here. I uh, My content is not really, from what I understand, my content's not really affected by those regulations because it's none of it is made for kids. So I've just been flagging it, not made for kids, not made for kids. I think everything should be fine. But if in case it's not, or even if you just want to, you can go subscribe to my newsletter. That link is in the description box as well. Okay, two more questions. This one is from Marigold who asks, uh, when using Prismacolor, how do you mitigate the bloom effect? Does it affect your work or do you draw fast enough to make a digital copy before the wax bloom forms? So um, if you're not familiar with what Marigold is talking about here, wax bloom is kind of like this powdery whitish haze that can appear over the top of your colored pencil pieces, uh, especially over like darker areas or it, it really it, it can appear anywhere, but it's most noticeable over darker areas. And especially if you have used a lot of pigments, so like if you've gotten a lot of pigment down into the paper, if it's a pretty heavy lay down of colored pencil. It's more likely to have wax bloom. So, um, Honestly, wax bloom had not really been that big of a deal to me. Um, it's, it had never been a big challenge for me when we lived in Boston because it's not that humid there. Um, and wax bloom tends to, from what I understand from others who do live in more humid areas, it's much more pronounced in really humid climates. But uh, after one year in Pennsylvania, well, one summer in Pennsylvania, I can say that even some pieces, I was flipping back through some portfolios recently and some uh, pieces that have been finished for a couple of years that never had wax bloom on them now do. Um, but I'm not worried about it because it's actually very easy to get rid of. So um, you to get rid of it, you can just use like a little cotton pad, one of those little cotton rounds um, or a Q-tip if it's a really small area. Don't put anything on it, keep it totally dry and just really softly uh, with a really, really gentle pressure, just kind of wipe off the, the white haze. And you'll see there'll be some, like if it's all over a dark area, the little cotton pad will pick up some of that dark color, but it's really not much. What you want to avoid doing is if you're like wiping from a dark area to a light area, don't, you know, use different different uh, cotton pads for that use different or clean rags or whatever you're going to use but don't just like wipe all over your whole piece but go kind of carefully section by section and remove the the white haze and then to prevent it from forming again or um, if you've just made a new piece and you want to prevent it from ever forming, you can just use a colored pencil fixative. There are lots of them out there. If you think you are going to be spending, it sounds like you might spend a long time creating some of your pieces, like maybe across several days or several weeks. And if that's the case, uh, you can use a workable fixative. So you'll, when you're looking at fixatives, you'll see they'll, they'll either say um, permanent or workable. And you want to choose one that's workable if you plan on adding more on top of it. So. Um, yeah, and that will prevent the wax bloom from ever even forming. All right, last question. This is from Kitsun Kun. Uh, this is also about that. Uh, this was left on that same video, the one first step to take as a beginning illustrator, the, the mining, refining, uh, shining framework. 
Um, Kitsune says, I think I'm definitely in the refining phase. So that's the middle phase. I've been on Instagram for years now and I try to post consistently, but my problem is I never seem to be able to attract many new followers. I haven't seemed to crack the code, though I know people say post often and be authentic. Still, that hasn't worked for me. Any advice on that front? So to be perfectly honest, Instagram is something that I feel like I struggle with as well. And you may be rolling your eyes at me thinking, oh, you have 15,000 followers. Um, and I'm not at all complaining. I'm grateful for each and every one of those. Uh, and that's fine. That is, it's at where it's at. It is what it is. Uh, but if you compare it to uh, other artists, particularly other artists who are working full-time in illustration, who've been posting stuff for about as long as I have, I have a lot of posts on there. How many posts do I have? I have 1,500 posts on Instagram. So I've been on there since like 20. Well, posting since 2013, 2014, posting regularly. I had an app from when, um, I had an account from when the app was brand new, but I wasn't really posting regularly until five or six years ago. Um, and in that time I've posted over 1500 posts and I have, uh, yeah, just looking at the app here, 15.6 thousand followers. But if you compare that to other people who have a similar number of posts or who've been posting for as long as I have, uh, the, they usually have much larger audiences. And, uh, I don't know, I've, I've gone back and forth feeling like, you know, maybe I'm just not making work that is the right kind of work. You know, it's, it's realistic. So, um, but it's not like hyper realism, like CJ Hendry, somebody like that. So people are looking at it and they may think, oh yeah, that's really good. But they're not like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's a drawing or wow. I can't believe they did that with colored pencil. It's not really producing that sort of effect. Uh, and then on the other end, it's not really necessarily hashtag relatable content. It's not a comic. It's not, um, it's not something that people, um, yeah, feel like they want to share with their friends because it really connects to them or really relates to their lives. So I think those are two really broad buckets that art can fall into that like, oh my gosh, this is so inspiring versus the, oh wow, this is so relatable. And I, I feel like my work is maybe kind of in between those two things. It's not, yeah, it isn't really either one of those. Um, and so maybe that means it's just never going to have as big of an audience. It's never going to have as big of a poll. And at different points in time, I have put in a lot of work. Like I've taken classes on Skillshare. I took Omar Wynn's class, uh, on Instagram on Skillshare. Um, and it's a great class. If you are interested, uh, I can recommend it. It's a really fun class. All of Omar's classes are, uh, I will try to put a link in the description box. Um, but yeah, I don't have any like secret sauce to share with you. I totally would. I mean, I tell you guys pretty much everything I know. Uh, if I, if I did have any kind of idea beyond the common wisdom, like the, the posting regularly and having some sort of meaningful pithy content in the, um, the description, the little comment, the caption, that's what that's called. <laughs> um, yeah, those are kind of the two big things that they, they say to do. And there are pl plenty of people that have really massive accounts that don't do either of those things that only post every few weeks that, you know, don't really put anything in their, uh, captions. It hasn't, hasn't been something that I have, I don't feel like I have cracked the code either. I'll, yeah, I'll put it that way. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I would say, <laughs> I would just advise you to keep doing the same thing that I'm doing, which is trying to post as often as you can um, and trying to yeah, be real in the captions and put something that's thoughtful in there that isn't just like a, you know, a row of emojis, which I have totally done before. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't offer anything more substantive there. Uh, if you are like an Instagram master and you have lots of ideas about it, then please do leave those in the comments or point to any resources that you have found helpful that have, you know, helped you grow your base on Instagram. That is it. And I think that's it for this video. So, um, yes, uh, questions, comments, all of that, you guys know where to leave them. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you to everybody who asked questions, uh, whose questions were used in this video. Thank you to my patrons for sponsoring this video. Uh, and to Meg for editing it. Uh, if you're new here, please do subscribe, hit the like button, share your video with a friend. Uh, yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Everybody, I hope you have a great week and I will see you in the next video. Bye.